Good evening, everyone. People in the back, if you want to move up, please take the opportunity. Welcome, everyone. This evening, we will have members of the St. Paul's Committee present the updated design proposal for the adapted to use design of St. Paul's main building. Members of the various subcommittees will discuss the progress made regarding programmatic issues, legal analysis, historical issues, and the latest architectural plans. I must emphasize, as potential uses are vetted and become more defined, the Architectural Engineering Subcommittee updates the architectural schematic drawings accordingly. Again, the committee will continue to seek resident input throughout this process. The proposed adapted reuse or repurposing design of St. Paul's main building requires the greatest effort to analyze and develop when compared to preparing the scope of work for a demolition option or for a facade alternative. Several weeks ago, the village issued an RFP to obtain an independent cost estimator. We expect the responses to the RFP by Monday, October 17th. I urge everyone to contact the trustees and urge them to review and approve the most suitable proposal as soon as possible and no later than the October 27th for the trustees meeting. We all need to know the estimated cost for the different options under consideration. We also anticipate having the town hall to discuss the concept of facadism on October 26th and the potential demolition options on November 2nd. Please allow all the subcommittee to present their, their presentations this evening, and then we will open the meeting up for questions. I will now introduce Frank McDonough, Chair of the Program and Use Committee. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening and welcome. And a special welcome to the members of our Board of Trustees Without whom none of this process would be possible. A special salute to them, because without their leadership, it is highly unlikely that we would be here tonight. Thank you everyone. My name is Frank McDonough. I'm the chair of the Program I Use and Cost Analysis Committee. My family moved out here after World War II, and my three other brothers and three sisters were all from Garden State High School, as were our two children and eventually our two grandchildren. I've been involved in the St. Paul's effort since we moved back out here in 1992. So for 30 years, I've been a witness to the process that we're undergoing. Recently, the mayor asked me to chair the programmatic and use committee, and that's what we're here to talk about tonight. This is a conversation that has been over 30 years, but more recently, a conversation involving many new residents and a decision again, heroically chosen by our Board of Trustees to try and bring the St. Paul's issue to a resolution. As Mayor Cosmo said, we will be talking about facadism, which has many strong attributes, on October 26th, demolition on November 2, and then a subsequent town hall later on in November. The purpose is to make sure that every resident's voice is heard. Without that feedback, none of the plans make any sense. And so that's, at a minimum, what we hope to achieve tonight. Let me talk for a moment about how this works. After I speak, we'll hear from Peter Cole on the legal committee, and then we'll hear from our architectural and engineering committee, who will review the process of uh, the adaptive reuse. And then we'll take your questions. We began in January with the mayor's first meeting, and at that first meeting, we began the process of studying demolition and partial demolition. And that continued all the way through into June. Uh, we also began the engineering review, which was concluded in March uh, after several weeks of delay. And we finally got the engineer's report that told the programmatic and use committee that yes, the building was sound and capable of significant adaptive reuse. We then decided that rather than begin a review and a speaking or engagement tour, the better process was to review the last 30 years of resident suggestions so that the newer residents would have a baseline or the same starting point as the rest of the more mature residents of the village. That process, which took several weeks, 
reviewed every document, every newspaper, every board minute, every survey to discuss what the residents wanted over those 30 years, but those wants have changed. We then presented that in the town hall meeting at the end of June, not as an adaptive reuse, because we hadn't begun that process, but as the process of what the building would look like if any of the historical uses had been committed to. We got enormous amounts of feedback. So the period from January until June was merely a historical review to create a baseline for the discussion that was to follow. We then moved to phase two. What was phase two? Phase two was an invitation made to the Board of Trustees, to every group in the village, to come visit the programmatic uh, committee and meet with us on Tuesday nights and share their thoughts. It was very successful. We heard from athletes, we heard from performing arts, we heard from seniors, we heard from various members of uh, the, the community, uh, particularly in performing arts. And so our view and our way to update the historical data change. You'll see that change in the adaptive reuse plans tonight. After tonight, we will begin phase three. What is phase three? Phase three is an outreach by our committee that will include three more town halls, a total of five. And those town halls, as I said, will address facadism, uh, which we began studying in February and March, demolition, which we began studying in January. And we will present options to the village from professionals as to what the process of partial and total demolition would be and what the use could be behind the facade type of program. So please mark your dates, those dates in your calendar. Tonight, we're going to discuss through our engineers and our architects what we have heard over the last three, four months since we began the adaptive use process in June. What we would like to do as well is discuss how the village has changed over the years and how the needs have changed because without those changes incorporated into our plan, we will not be successful in either an adaptive reuse or facade reuse of our building. So the conversation that begins tonight will continue through November, and as long as it takes until every voice is heard. Now what voice will not be heard tonight? We're not gonna talk about parking tonight, because parking is something that will uh, be determined after uh, we decide what the use is. We have several individuals who are quite confident in parking, and we promise them that they will be part of this process because parking and traffic will become an integral part of this. But that's not tonight's discussion. Tonight's discussion is what have we heard, what are we going to hear, and what can we do next? Finally, I'd like to make sure we are all in agreement that anything we do on an architectural and engineering basis must be affordable. I love architects. I've been involved in infrastructure development for 30 years. I ran the public-private partnership at Goldman Sachs for multiple years with projects all around the country, and our team did over $100 billion worth of these kinds of projects. Every architect has a plan, but none of those plans make sense unless the people who are using that facility can afford it. So our <coughs> promise to you as the second half of the programmatic committee is, while we are focused on programs right now, once we finish with all of the listening and hearing your voices, we will begin a cost analysis. The mayor has indicated he would like a cost estimator hired. That's the mayor's prerogative. We will wait for those estimates and begin to determine what is feasible, what is affordable, and what is financeable, and then present those options to you. So the process is multi-phase. Number one, what are the uses that we see? And we're doing that in three phases. Number one, historical. Number two, listening. And number three now, historic, or rather, uh, uh, resident outreach. We will then go into a cost analysis and present prices and options for the village to determine which of the many options they might like to pursue. That's our process. Let me give you my phone number in case any of you have any questions at any time. 
It's 917-691-7782. We are happy to meet with you or any of your groups anytime that's convenient for you. And a special outreach, please, to the performing arts parents and the special needs parents. We've heard part of what your demands and needs can be. We'd like to hear more and in greater detail. I'd like to introduce now Peter Cole, who will talk about the legal limits on the process. And then thereafter, we'll hear from our architect and engineer, who will take you through the plans. And then we'll be open for your questions. And then we'll hear our conclusions. Thank you very much. Peter. Good evening. Um, in 30 years ago, the village acquired St. Paul's for municipal and public use. In but 2004, it was by the trustee resolution. It was restricted to parkland use. That creates an issue because parkland use is much more limited than public. In municipal use and there are exceptions to get around that but those exceptions require you to go to Albany requires you to get legislation that less legislation is not guaranteed it takes time and it's typically conditioned so what we have tried to do and you'll hear will at least describe the uses tonight all of those uses have been reviewed by our committee and we believe are possible and without municipal without getting legislation from Albany. Now, you may have questions about use. There's no bright line. I'd be happy to talk to you about uh, use, um, public park use, but would, the best way to do that, I think, is after Will describes what is being suggested or considered, and then we can answer questions as to why that is permissible or why things that you may wish to see there may not be so why don't you hold those questions till the end, and I'll be happy to discuss it. Thank you, Peter. I'd like to introduce Chairman of our Architectural Committee, Will Elise, as well as Brian Gemmel, both long-term residents of the village. Will has been a professional architect for decades, and Brian has been a professional engineer for an equal amount of time. Brian's expertise is actually in value engineering, and the difference between an architect and a building is Brian. He's the one that translates those plans into actual use, and so we have both the theoretical, conceptual, and the practical here. We'll take you through the plans and then help you with any questions you may have. Thank you, Frank. Um, my voice doesn't carry very much, so don't hesitate in telling me you know. Um, there's a saying that says that an architect is a bloke who knows very little, I'm sorry, he knows a lot about very little. Sorry, an engineer isn't a clueless. <laughs> an architect knows very little about a lot, and an engineer knows a lot about very little. And this is actually very true in terms of our profession. And I think the combination of Brian as a mechanical engineer and myself as an architect uh, has produced a formidable plan. Very quickly, my background, I've had an international career in architecture that's taken me from uh, Japan to Madrid to London. And uh, each time we always came back to Garden City where we brought our start at home. And I've raised four children here and I feel very much that I'm a resident of this uh, village, and uh, I'm hopeful that we'll do the right thing. St. Paul's, in the same year I bought my house here, became up for grabs. <laughs> and it's remarkable that for 30 years it's been up for grabs, so we're hoping that um, this effort, this time, will produce some results. We've done a floor plan, as you can see, and we'll be taking you through the floor plans. The thing I want to emphasize is that um, every effort has been made to capture the demographic needs of the village. 
but this is a concept. As Frank uh, alluded to, we've been uh, very much uh, influenced by your input and we continue to be. Case in point, we had a senior center that was formally shown in our plans. We've since taken it out after hearing input that there's no need for a senior center. Um, whether that will be the final answer or not remains to be told. But right now you won't see the senior center in these plans. This is the latest iteration. We keep reviewing and changing and revising the plans. And that's likely to continue. Um, the other thing I wanted to stress, if you look at the floor plans, they're color-coded. So I'll take you through that. That's just for functionality. But very important, every wall that you see there that's black is existing to remain. Every wall that's red is new construction. And if you have good eyesight, you'll see dotted inlines. That's demolition. So this isn't the final plan, but this is a concept. The other thing that was uh, very important in developing these floor plans uh, was Peter's input from the point of view of the legalities. We have certain limitations as to what can go in as far as functionality, and that impacted um, our choices. So I'd like to introduce uh, Brian Gemmel, and Brian's our engineer, and uh, Brian, why don't you come here and take over. Thank you, Will. Hello, everybody. My name is Brian Gemmel. Uh, I have a loud voice. I've had to yell across construction sites my whole career, 30 plus years. So if I uh, seem a little bit loud, I'm sorry. Basically, uh, Will said a lot about you know the, the inherent benefits of the building, the structure. I'll get more into that. Just like uh, Frank. Uh, I'm going to offer myself to anyone that would like to speak to me one-on-one. -on -one. Um, the reason I say that is I'm not giving you my, my background and why I'm up here today. Said to you, 30 plus years of a career, I moved into Garden City in 02. My wife and I are like many in town who lived outside on the edges of town whose dream was to get to Garden City. Hey, that's where the rich people live. That's when you made it, okay? We're different than the other areas around us. Um, the architecture, the beauty, um, it's where you want to live. That's just my opinion. Um, for years after I got here, I followed the drama of the politics with St. Paul. I thought it was very sad. Um, what I couldn't understand was I didn't see a lot of real fabric of why the building couldn't be reused. I heard stories about the toxic environment, this, that, and the other thing. Look, 30 years I've worked in a toxic environment. That's construction. I'm going to say that we have a lot of myths here, and we want to talk a lot of facts. I had a guy come up to me one day in town at Leo's. You can't develop that whole building. You know what, you can't do it in phases. You can't do this. And I said, I said, really? Well, that's just completely untrue. You know, we have a lot of opinions and there are a lot of opinions out there. Our job is to give you the truth, the facts. Um, I've worked on 15 years building data centers for IBM. After that, 15 plus more years, because I wouldn't take a foreign assignment, I transitioned to working for construction companies, large construction companies in the city, Gilbane, Lear, JRM, very large companies. I've had a rich and wide variety of projects. I've done interior renovations. I've done complete buildings out of the ground as the head MEP manager and structural superintendent. Um, I've worked on buildings like St. Paul, the Packer School in Brooklyn Heights, the Mary McDowell School at the St. Charles Borromeo campus in Brooklyn Heights, just two blocks away, um, the National Dance Institute at West 147th in Harlem in a building that was built in 1890. 
the commonality is all these buildings are old construction architecture. They're not modern like you would see in Manhattan, out of the ground steel structures with the hanging facade. These are brick on brick. They're not cantilever construction. If you don't know what cantilever construction is, it's when steel supports and hangs a lightweight construction. It's a modern building method. Many people in town have said, knock that thing down, put in a new steel structure. We've looked at it, we've evaluated it. We feel differently. And I'll explain that. Basically, if you look at St. Paul's, Go in your backyard and stack about two foot wide by two foot wide by two foot tall of brick. Try to move it. It is one of the most solid building methods. It, basically, they build castles this way, but they use stone instead of brick. St. Paul's, in other words, it's a modern castle. I'm going to skip off this microphone. If you can't hear me, please let me know, but I just want to point some things out. If you look at this up here, these walls going around what we would call a facade, these are all bearing walls. Bearing walls are what hold the building up. Then you've got this wall here and this wall here. The hallways are the central bearing wall for the building. They help support the outer walls. Basically, the only walls that don't bear a load in this, pro in this type of architecture are these walls. Here, 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 here. These coming out. Oh, these are coming out. In your home, you'd pay thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to take out a wall that's a bearing wall to get an open concept. Not here. Those walls are easily removed because the way these walls tie into the hallway is through the wooden joists in the floors, and then in the hallway, and then in the ceiling again. Basically, this old architecture is well designed. The thing where it falls down is that it's shaped like this as an E because of the bearing standards. This we looked at. We read the Tomasetti report. We looked at the building itself with a walkthrough. And we found the building to be very stable. I'll debate that with anyone. We also have a structural engineer on the team, Joe Jabor. He has his own company. He's a licensed structural engineer. He looked at this as well. And we all came to the same determination. What's great about this construction when you want to renovate is that it's really not a big job. It's interior construction. We're not flying in new steel to put up a new building. What we're doing is we're removing some walls to make a larger room. These are not difficult things to do. They're brick. They're plastic. They're wood lath. You might find it strange, but in the plaster you see sinew, it's horse hair. That's how it ties together. It's like the, the rebar of plaster is where you have rebar in construction. Um, when I work with Will, as he said, we complement each other in that my life has been bringing things out of the ground. I care more about things being stable than they being pretty. You guys pretty it up. That's what I loved about you guys. Essentially, in this position, you've got an Ivy League quality building. You've got solid oak doors. You, when, we, when we walked through and looked at 
the details, especially on the first floor, of stone door frames in incredibly solid shape. There were no cracks when we looked at them. And you've got oak doors that are still swinging unobstructed after, what, 130, 40, 50 years? I think that says something about the building and its settling. Because you wouldn't see that if the building was really heaving and, you know, not stable. I also studied the Tomasetti report and came up with several conclusions. First of all, in that report, nowhere does it say that the building is in imminent fate of collapse. Uh, in fact, the opposite. It talks about, when it uses the word structure, that's not structural. They talk about structure for the mansard roof. The roof doesn't hold up the building, the building holds up the roof. Yes, there are repairs to make. I hate to say it, but 30 years of no roof? I won't comment any further. The damage that's been done is surface damage. For me to build, he always tries to get me. He comes up one morning before my coffee, he calls me. How, how long do you think it would take you to do that plan I went over with you last night? I said, uh, 14 months. Two different crews, two different construction companies. Because we have areas where we're going to do some light duty construction. Real stuff, a little bit of foundation, some steel. But what's beautiful about this, with a building like this, I've got walls to support steel where I don't have to run vertical columns. All I've got to do is carve out a beam pocket, put in a bearing plate, fly in steel, set it on the best bearing lo load point I would ever want. The building has many, many positives when it comes to renovating. I walked through rooms and I was keeping account. Look, I may have a young face, I'm 59, Walk in that whole building one morning at the end, oh boy, was I really done. We went all the way up into the clock tower, everything climbed around. As I was going through, I was making mental note of what do these rooms need? Cleaning floors, sanding floors, refinishing floors, finishing plaster, patching plaster. These are finish disciplines. This is an interior job. Got a couple of walls to build. Got some, got some uh, code compliance to deal with. I don't find it challenging. If I had to say easy, medium, difficult, this is on the easy level. It's not challenging. Not to do what we see we would like to provide at this point. I've looked at the pictures. I know how you feel. My God, look at that. Can you imagine living in that? Tons of peeling paint. Plaster broken, you got some wood that needs to be, you know, replaced because of water infiltration. But I can assure you, the building's not falling down. Now, on the facade, there are elements that have been noted by Tomasetti to be loose. Could they fall? A brick, a piece of stone? Possibly. I really doubt it. But that's why there's a fence to keep people away. But that doesn't mean the building's gonna collapse. It's not. We just got a roof on there. I think that speaks volumes and will do a tremendous amount of help to the structure. Pointing the facade, new windows, absolutely. The building has been plagued with decay. But I'll add up all that decay, and it's not like building a new building. Demolishing the building and building a new building. No. This is a much easier method. I went back. I said to, said to Will, okay, if I really was having a bad year, 18 months scheduled beginning to end. And there's a reason. Do you see a lot of red here? Build a wall. Most of the demo could be completed within a month for the interior walls that have to go. And then wall, door, 
there's really not a ton of work. And this is bringing it into code compliance. Another myth out there is, oh my God, what will it take to get this building into code compliance? Well, I'll tell you one thing. First of all, the hallways and the doors are already built compliant. They're huge. I don't know how many of you have ever walked through that building, but it is special. Look out those building windows to those fields. You feel like you're on top of the world. Um, it's a vast hallway system. Uh, code compliance, fire safety, life safety, not a challenge. Because from a value engineering perspective, I'll just link this. I worked and built several Google facilities in the city. What I loved about those facilities was it's basically a white box with surface mounted electrical HVAC. Made my portion of the job very easy. There's no reason we can't do that to a large degree in this building. Um, it's, it's easily done because you've got solid foundation and walls to work with. Uh, that's one of the things that the person argued with me. Oh, you can't, you can't do, you know, bring it up to code compliance and phase it. Yeah, it can. Sprinkler, life safety, fire alarm throughout the building, but I don't have to finish. I have to close walls and holes, but I don't have to make it pretty. If I don't need it, why would I do that? Value engineering can save a lot of money. In talking with people, I had a guy who was like, yeah, I was looking at the numbers, probably goes, they had $5 million to refinish all the doors and oak. Why? That oak, that finish from the 19th century is better than anything we could do. I've seen it. It's more a cleanup. Anything rotted gets replaced, but the majority of it has not had water leak on it. It's dirty because of the peeling paint and the dust and the plaster dust, but it's not, it's not smart to go build a Taj Mahal that doesn't mean that there shouldn't be some rooms that should be brought back to the original opulence of the building. Maybe at the entry area, maybe in a couple of the you know, engaging areas, the chapel, but the rest of it, they're just rooms. Doors, windows, heat, air conditioning, light, life safety. Um, I think that's where you and I sometimes challenge each other on the value engineering. Why don't we get to the building? Okay. Let's let you go. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Um, sort of uh, concluding what Brian said, it's a Gothic style building, neo Gothic actually, and in Gothic times you had cathedrals, and you know cathedrals have flying buttresses to hold that brick together. What this building has instead is this internal um, bearing wall system. And what that does is basically supports the building, which allows us to do anything we want along the perimeter, but limits what we can do along the corridor. Once again, whatever's in red is new, whatever's in black is existing. This is a, an option we have, we call it the athletic option for the ground floor. And basically you come into the blue area, which I call a community center, and there's an atrium here to form a, a grander entrance, if you will, that will let you appreciate the grand staircase that exists and hopefully the skylight above. Here you have your main reception with exhibit rooms on either side. There's security and coat rooms here. And when you walk down here, you have an eatery. You may notice these ramping, there's ramps all over the place, there's ramps outside here. That's all been added to make it code compliant. And I'm still trying to figure out some ramping details for here, but basically these are two openings in the building. And what I've done is put in sports fields in each one. You'll notice in red, it's a basketball field. I don't know if you can see clearly, there's a blue line here, that's a tennis court. So it's kind of anticipating what you could do with those spaces. 
Uh, there's some things that we would have to work out, how to treat windows, etc. But in, in principle, you could do athletics here. We've also had a request for a turf field. We'll get into that at the end of the presentation. But in response to that, there's a sports assembly room and an office up here. The rest of the space is allocated largely to the um, recreation department, which has requested filmmaking, photography. This is a game room with table tennis, billiards, that sort of thing. And this pink area here is actually a children's center. And what we're proposing here is an admin area for staff, a special needs room, enrichment rooms, there's a uh, indoor playground, and music rooms. So these are existing bathrooms which we would be restoring. And we have bathrooms here. Yeah. As far as elevator for vertical transportation, we've added one centrally located. There are two in the building now. These would have to be replaced with larger models to meet code, but we've retained them as well. Uh, Brian, can you advance? What's that? Can you advance the uh, slide? Sure. That way I'm not walking back and forth. All right. So we go here. Okay. Yeah. Don't. This is where I want to be. The green is athletic facilities, and if we take that scheme, we bring it down to the lower level. I'm purposely not calling it a basement, but a lower level, because it has wide window exposure, and even though it's partially submerged, it doesn't really have that feel. We have a huge weight room here. This is a rare area in the building with a wide expanse of open space. You see there are still columns that were in place. Then again, with some partial demolition, we have bathrooms and locker rooms. We have storage rooms. We have, this is a yoga room, exercise room, cardio. So we have these facilities, all dedicated to sports. Over here, we have some pickle courts pickleball courts, and the rest, what you see in gray, is mechanical, electrical, and IT to service the whole building. There's an emergency management wing, which we've maintained here. It was explained to us that when there's an emergency in the village, like Hurricane Sandy, and people come from other states, or even Canada, or whatever, to help out, they need a place to meet and work. So. We kind of dedicated this portion to it. Next slide. Okay, we said that was an option. There's another option where we take the open area and we create a theater. There's a lack of theatrical space here in Garden City. We've been talking with dance groups and we're starting our dialogue with theater groups, etc. But um, this can accommodate a minimum of 300, and I think up to 330. So it's a good sized theater, 30 foot deep stage, with um, theatrical support space behind, directly behind the stage. This would be a green room. And we took our model for this as the platform theater in Port Washington, which was a similarly renovated school that was converted to community use, and uh, we studied the theater requirements, what they did right, what they didn't, and we tried to correct it. There's toilet rooms, but the rest of the space then allocates back to the community center, which I described earlier as two exhibit rooms, reception, atrium, that all stays the same, a little gift shop. When you walk into here, is the eatery. In the lower level is the kitchen. That's the existing kitchen and cafeteria of the school. So it's a matter of restoring what was there. This is another option where instead of sports or theater, what we put in there is an outdoor courtyard. And we thought, you know, it'd be a beautiful evening out if you go to the theater, you get a bite to eat, you sit here and eat. 
something you could do, or you could pick up your kid, he's still doing filmmaking, you're sitting here waiting for him to be. It becomes a secondary space that I think will be used and appreciated. These are options. In this case, we have a vestibule to the theater with lighting and sound, an ADA toilet. Here, we have a pergola. So there's like a courtyard entry into the building. Brian? Sure. What I was talking before about, it's an interior's job, but we have some intermediary construction. We'll just use, you got the basketball courts and the theater. This is as complex as it gets. But the benefits here are, you've got surrounding bearing walls, which can be used to fly in steel to support the theater. We can either go down into the ground and excavate and lay it in on footings and foundations, or we can actually let it sit above that on steel. The roof, again, simple. We fly in steel. I can see the steel erection for a project like this being four weeks just to get that structure done, being that it's not that heavy in construction or complexity. But this is about as far as it gets. Thanks, Will. I'll be right. Well, that's a very good point. In this scheme, the theater is the big build in the project. The rest, again, you see there's the orange. It's like the other floor. Ready? Yep. Okay, when we go, this is the lower level of that scheme. And it starts very similarly with a weight room, cardio room, exercise room. The main difference is that the toilet and locker areas will be shared with the theater. So the actors have a place to change, et cetera. And these yellow rooms here are more theater support spaces for stagecraft, storage, et cetera. But otherwise, it's the same. Here's the pickleball courts, the emergency management area, mechanical, electrical, and IT. Next slide. The next floor is the second floor. And again, the blue is the community center. And what we have here are multi-purpose rooms. These can be meeting rooms, uh, but there could be a special function that they need a room for. We've had Girl Scouts complaining they don't have space. We, uh, we tend to invade the senior center all the time, but you know, recently we tried to have a meeting there. It was booked. We had to plan a different day, et cetera. It's not always available. And as the population grows in the village, more and more meeting space will be required. So that's kind of what we've done here. That's the atrium above with a balcony looking down. That, by the way, is really the only architectural caprice, for lack of another word, in here. I had to stick it in somewhere, but, um, you know, I think that's an opportunity to do acknowledgement walls and items of that nature and really kind of define the, the, the essence of the building. The orange here is all Department of Recreation, and this wing here is all, I would say, performing arts oriented. We've got music rooms, we've got dance rooms, we've got um, aerobics. This is their admin area. And the thing to focus in on um, with this is that the people who will be performing that theater, whether it's your own children or grandchildren, they'll have a place to dance, play their instrument, leave their tuba here, whatever. So, you know, right now it's a real, I don't want to say struggle, but they're constantly changing rooms, et cetera, clue it all, trying to make that happen. And this would be an opportunity to uh, fix that. If we go to the other side, again, Department of Recreation, it's all in orange. This is more static as opposed to dynamic in terms of movement. This is where we have science labs, computer labs. Uh, there's a team game room, and there's a team computer room. We also have Lego and robotics, which is very important in the village. Uh, these are science labs up here. And we also have very important painting, and they want to add sculpture. This would be a sculpture studio and facing north are two painting studios. 
nor apply this ideal to painting. Next. Sorry, can you go back one? <laughs> I, I always forget this. This is the chapel. And the chapel is a kind of a very precious spot in the building. Um, it needs restoration work, but it's a magnificent space uh, that we're hoping to preserve. So you would have access to the chapel here as well. It'd be non-denominational, we would imagine. And, uh, you know, you could also have other functions there that are not religious in nature, like recitals. Okay, next. The next floor is largely dedicated in blue to the community center. We have a huge and fairly dynamic two-story high reception room and then more multi-purpose rooms. Because we have this special space that we could see it being rented out for special functions or we would have a servery, co-room, etc., just to support this room. The rest of the space is right now not to be used. At one point we were investigating the possibility of doing a STEM center. I'm hoping in the future that will be resurrected in some manner. But right now that's not a function that legally we can pursue. Next. Again, this is devoted to the community center. This is the open ceiling above. It's a two-story space. We have more multi-purpose rooms here. This area here has to do with an, an internal gardening. And this is something that would not only support a um, STEM center, but it would support the community as a whole. There's a horticultural office and storage room, and all this is now opened of the chapel for that purpose. The fact that we're likely to lose the current community garden makes this, I think, of interest to a lot of people in the community. The way the building is oriented, it breaks into different pavilions at this point. We put in catwalks to link them, but these are growth plants, basically. And you have these outcrops, such as the clock tower up here um, that you know you have to get to, etc. But it's largely storage space at this point. Okay. The last floor, the fifth floor, has a very dramatic space as well. And uh, at one point I thought of a dance hall. Um, there's a security area here for that as well. But again, it's another reception room, another multi-purpose room. It doesn't have to be dedicated to the teens. So we had some people were saying that's a great idea. Other people were opposed to it. We do have to think about the teen demographic in the village. Um, but whether we do that or not, it's a good size room. OK. It's a roof plant in Gaul. St. Paul's is a beautiful building. You can see the architecture is just exquisite. This is the rear facade. Most people are used to seeing the front facade, but this is in the back. And what we did here was, this is the athletic scheme where we built out here and here. So to enclose those athletic fields if we go in that direction. What we try to do is match the architecture of the building. This is a mirror image of what's on the wall behind it. That's just a concept. Another idea is to do a Renzo Piani type of modern metal and glass partition and make a modern statement in the back. That could also be addressed. Okay. This is the other option. If you do the athletic scheme, I'm, I'm sorry, the performing arts scheme, you would enter here to go into that theater. Here, I don't know if it's that clear in this, but it's actually open, and that's the pergola that would lead to that open courtyard. As far as the open courtyard, the fields, the theater, they're all interchangeable. You could have, instead of the courtyard, you could have a field on one side, a theater on the other, 
two fields, whatever. By the way, this is, to make this room accessible, we had to build a fire escape. So that would empty into the courtyard. Next slide. These are just sections showing the effect of, um, of this breaking it down. So you see the building in the background. Okay. Again, another section through here. The other was the athletic scheme. This is a performance scheme. So this would be the, um, the stage. So it's an elevated stage and it would be tiered seating. If you go to the next slide, you could see here, if we had the field as a basketball court, you start getting the effect of that with the nets. Next. And if it's a theater, it tears down and you have to, whoop, and it ends up with the stage. Okay? Now, I promised you a turf field, so let me talk to you a little bit about that. This is the site plan of St. Paul's. And the building is E-shaped, as you can see. We're considering the demolition of the cottages. They're kind of falling apart anyway. And the creation of parking fields here. The parking field in this scheme would take into consideration the um, community garden and the cottage field area. That would add close to 440 spaces. We've added some additional spaces here, I think 69. But again, the whole parking scheme has to be addressed. That was an early study. Next. If we were to put a turf field, we spoke with sports people, what they needed, etc. They gave us a dimension of 115 yards by 60 yards. They wanted bleachers and they wanted benches on the side. And this is an idea where it's oriented this way. And it kind of works off the building a little bit, which is kind of nice. But it also connects to the field house a little bit, which also seems to make sense. However, this really does eat into the parking situation. So we're going to have to be, if we were to go that route, we would have to um, investigate what to do about parking. Final. The other scheme we have is an existing field here, is convert this field into a turf field. It's right next to the baseball court. So it would have the same requirements as the other one. There's a row of pine trees here that would be retained. It would just work off it. Uh, so I kind of had these two schemes vetted initially. They were very well received. There was comment that maybe they don't need the ball field. That's all a conversation. We need that in front. Uh, if the ball field were to go, we could slide it down or even locate it vertically. I didn't locate it vertically here because I didn't want to get too close to the houses. And I think that's it. Okay. What you've just seen is countless hours of their time thinking about how best to express architecturally and with an engineering point of view the voices we heard both historically in phase one from January until June and in the speaking uh, and listening part in phase two that I refer to from the end of June to the end of uh, August. Let me point out one thing. We were listening to what we think are several of the major constituents in our village. Number one, seniors. You'll notice that there is no senior center because the seniors have come to us and said, we like what we have and we don't need to have anything at St. Paul's. Okay, that was removed. And if there is a change, we're happy to adapt to that. The second thing is we listen to the athletes both intramural and interscholastic, and they had a request for interior basketball courts, which we affectionately refer to as the Kelly Family Courts, 
uh, referring to some of the old great basketball players in our village. And the third thing we did was we listened to the performing arts group. We'd like to hear more from them, as well as a special needs group who were looking for space. None of this was generated by the committee. All of this was generated by your neighbors and other residents, and we have responded to that. What that means is we'd like to hear from you. And we're going to move into Q&A now, but also remember what we said at the beginning. These are architectural plans. They're not actual results. Actual results will depend on what the entire village wants after we listen again in phase three in our outreach, and two, what we can afford. There's a lot of space in here that is being saved because this building may have to be phased, staged, developed over a period of years, much like the Garden City Pool. That's an option for all of us. Remember, none of this works if it's not affordable. So I'd like to have, when Will comes back, or rather when Brian comes back, uh, Will is here to answer any questions you may have, and uh, happy to have give you one of the mics from up here to, to speak. And if you'd wait, uh, Bill Gary will hand this out. So questions for Will and Brian, or suggestions based on the presentation, we'd be happy to have. Hi, my name is Jeff Cunningham. You guys have done a fabulous job. I mean, seriously. So based on what I saw three, five years ago, this is a huge jump in the right direction. Huge. Now, I, I do have my first question is to absolutely fabulous job. My first question is to legal. What what strikes me as incredibly, I will fit right in here, would be an extension of the Garden City High School. That said, we started to talk about the stem cell. We started to talk about the, the arts. We started to talk about drama. Oh my God, music. This could be an adjunct to a building that needs renovation, that needs in high school. So, first thoughts. Oh, oh okay, it's live. Um, a school would be the expansion of the school onto the property would yes, be sir. impermissible without enabling legislation from Albany. Parkland use, there, there, there are no bright regulations or guidelines. It's all by uh, court decision. And one of the court decisions out there says that you can't put your a school on parkland. And as a consequence of that, you would have to go to Albany. Would Albany grant that permission? I, I don't know. As I said before, it would take some time. It's not guaranteed. And in, inevitably, there's conditions imposed upon the grant. Let me, let me further address that. Because I have been a, a big proponent, as you may know, remember, on STEM. So because of that legal issue that was raised by one or two people, we have deferred the issue of STEM. There is a significant difference, when you look at the cases, between a school and a program. If you will notice in the architectural work, there are many enrichment programs. Legos, robotics, a garden. We could have a center for the study of climate change here that would all be consistent with the recreational athletic, musical, performing arts are things that are generally viewed as obviously permissible, but wouldn't be a school. They would be co-curricular, extracurricular, K through 12, that we could accommodate over time. When you look at this, one of the things that will eventually strike you is that we're really developing what amounts to a university here. This is a place for continuing enrichment K through 80 years old. And you can, we expect to have residents using this several times a week of all ages at different times. And you can go, have your enrichment, have a Broadway show in your theater, listen
listen to your children practice away from your garage. Go in and have a nice dinner or a club room if you don't want to join Cherry Valley or the Country Club. We have that here. If it's affordable. Great plan, but it must be affordable. And Jeff, to put your mind at ease, we visited the Shamanat STEM Center. I actually accompanied Frank. We toured it extensively and we checked all the facilities and we kind of did the research. We have the space, but we have to get over this one. You'll notice in the plans that there's considerable space that is not designated. That's because we don't have to put mechanical or other costs into the entire building. You do not have to preserve the entire building. You can do this in stages or phases based on your budget, just like you do with your home and just like we did with the Garden City Pool. Just a, a bunch of follow-up questions. <clears throat> the, the question was, since St. Paul's was in fact a school way back when, when we Garden City inherited, the question here is, since we're using a school function, and whatever you said regarding the, the change in regulation, it would still be, yes, yes, I understand you're skinning a cat here. Yes, I get that clearly. But if it was a school, why, at this point in time, the regulations changed, you're saying it needs legislative approval to change it back to what it was? Yes, yes, because it's been designated parkland. A designation of parkland precludes a I'm, school I'm being- sorry, I'm gonna interrupt. By whom was it des designated? The, the Board of Trustees in 2004. Of Garden City? Of Garden City. Yes, you may remember at that time, that there was a considerable push by various real estate interests that had, from 1992 on, been trying to develop this. There was one developer said, hey, you've already turned the middle of your town into Forest Hills. What does it matter what you do at St. Paul's? In order to prevent that from happening, Mayor Barbara Miller offered the uh, resolution that it be declared parkland and won by one vote and that ended the use of that as a both private use and as real estate development use. Okay, then the next question would be, if they designated it, the only way they could, un again, I'm repeating myself, undesignated would have to be through Albany. Correct. That being said, in skinning that cat, there are many ways to have enrichment. One other, a uh, bunch of other questions, and then I'll give up the microphone. Uh, right now, the way I'm looking at it is this is a significant, significant area here. And right now, I am, I am a senior citizen, believe it or not, and I do attend the senior center, which is fine. And to the questions of the board, the, the senior center, at least from the men's side, is waning. My question here is, with all this, are, are we building it so that if we build it, they'll come? And I'm using the senior center as a guide. Will they come, number one? Will it be open for them to come? Because the senior center is only open a certain time, a certain amount of time during the day. So with all that we're talking about, which I, I think is great, but if it's not available, and if the population you're trying to address can't get there or it's closed when they can, what are we talking about? We, we recognize that there are many important demographic cohorts within the village. Music and performing arts, a huge group. Recreational athletes, K through 12, a huge group. Interscholastic, a huge group. The other huge group, and one of the growing groups, are widows within the village. Some have not felt enormously comfortable in the current senior center. We will make every effort, even though we will not call it a senior center, to accommodate everyone. There will be a community room, a club room, that will echo the casino, Cherry Valley, Garden City Country Club, so that anyone who does not want to join those or cannot join them will have that same club experience, be able to go down to a restaurant, watch their grandchildren play in the Kelly courts or on the turf field, and 
listen to them in the theater or go to an off-Broadway play. We will do everything to accommodate our seniors because they've helped preserve this village over decades. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you guys. I just like that this is so inclusive. You know, it really doesn't represent just one thing, and it kind of includes all the people of this town, and it serves everybody. It's a multi-purpose idea, and I just love that. And in the school, I mean, at the time when I went, it was just an unbelievable structure. And it still sort of is, you know, the, if you look around at the basic maintenance that wasn't done, that, you know, the cleanup really presents itself really well. You ever have a chance to to walk around and look at the architecture. But actually, if you get a chance to go in, it's really kind of an amazing building. But this, to have this building in your town, you guys are very lucky, it's fun to say. And I'm, you know, the group that I represent, is very excited to see something happen in this building because we want to preserve it because it's like, that's our, um, you know, our, our happy place. So I just want to thank you so much for putting all the effort into this, the, the committee, but also the town people too. I mean, you've had to endure a lot over the years. But I really like the progress, positive progress you guys are doing. So thank you so much. And, and I think you should, I think you should notice we have reached out to the alum quite some time. There's another aspect here if you look around the room, and I don't mean to be focused, but there aren't a lot of people who are new to the village, and nor are there a lot of attendees who have young families. They are mis- and underrepresented in most of our discussions, yet they are a critical component. When you look at the cohorts coming through our schools, you'll notice that we're getting larger and larger classes as they introduce into the lower schools coming up. They're not here, but their voices will also be heard, and we're gonna reach out to them over the next few weeks. Trustee Lamberti, Lamberti. Frank, always, I just always a pleasure. Uh, I'd like to... <coughs> I'd like to revisit this issue of STEM. Now, I think okay. the gentleman who spoke before at the outset said, I'd like to make this an extension of the Garden City High School. And Peter correctly said, because I'm on that committee, it's clear the case law that you can't put a school. But a school means part of the high school, where you, get, where you teach courses and you get credit the courses. Now, on the other hand, there's nothing that says you can't teach things. You describe it as an enrichment. So my question is, what would you want to do if you had STEM, apart from bringing in the Garden City or making it an extension of the high school? So why can't you accommodate whatever the need is that you see the community needs for students and young people sure. that you can't have it now. I think, as opposed I think to we can always school. rely on trustee. I'm sorry? I said we can always rely on you for thoughtful questions. Whether but they're, whether is, whether they're you, STEM you, or well, parking or church and state and chapel. Right, so let me, I, let me just say this. You make a very important point because when we talk to the individual who runs Parkland, the state of New York, who is from Garden City and is familiar with Garden City, in effect she said, do what you need to do, ask forgiveness, not permission. We have had significant conversations with Superintendent Sunha, who recognizes that this kind of a facility would provide not just curricular, but co-curricular and extracurricular support K through 80 years old. And that continuing effort to help our seniors, people who are transitioning in their job, people who 
need skills, this is a location for that. And STEM, remember, is the next phase. Garden City, historically, was a planned community. Created a personality when it was the Fifth Avenue of Long Island, where every New York retail store was here. Then, when it fell apart because of Roosevelt Fields, we became the Wall Street of Long Island. Up and down Franklin Avenue, there's nothing but banks, or were. Now, the next phase may be, if we start using this as a magnet for other WeWorks technology, etc., you now have the next economic engine for Garden City. And we will be working on that, but not just yet. When we do, after we solve the parking problem together, you will be with us and we will address that. In the meantime, we have plenty of space for continuing it for seniors, for people who are transitioning from their jobs and need more tech skills in basic coding, Excel, other types of skills, beginning with children in Legos. These are all possible and a part of this plan. So, so let me finish with this comment. I'm involved in a program now for High Bridge Voices, which is a section in the Bronx, poor section, section eight housing. And these kids, ranging from elementary through high school, all right, so Fordham University is now adopting a program. I might have, I can, you know, we can talk about this in a little more detail and see what the model program is. We've got professors, students going over to High Bridge, certainly not in an exquisite building like this. We're talking about in the basement of, of, of apartment houses, but in mentoring, instructing kids, poor kids in STEM. Now, I don't know what the difference is, what they do there as opposed to what you have here, but I sense that it's probably is the type of thing that you want to talk about. I think that's exactly right. Let me make it one step clearer for you. What did we experience with COVID? We experienced children learning at home. The experience of learning through your computer from teachers who would come from Feinstein, Cold Spring Harbor labs, from Brookhaven labs, from all the major academic scientific community that is all over Long Island, could be part of that process and then use that process through computers and massive open online courses to help less fortunate communities and their better students to learn more in this process. That's absolutely part of our program. Amen. Uh, Frank, if I may, just to add to that. Tom, you brought up a great point. Um, I have to say it was very engaging from my perspective. Take, uh, I've got a daughter in college, I've got a son in the high school, ninth grade. You know, when you look at Garden City and, and what it represents for people like myself who came here, came here for the schools. And I think that there's definitely a synergy between the district and us doing something in this building. I mean, for example, college prep. I think that's something that everybody in Garden City with kids in the school, whether they be in Chaminade, whether they be in Kellenberg, whether they be in the high school here, you know, SAT prepping, you know, uh, you know, uh, things to get ready for college, Co you know, college hunting, you know, getting the, you know, getting the help in that regard. I think that, you know, Frank, uh, you know, from an education perspective, I think we're only really scratching the surface at this point, but I think we need to really dig deep into it. Well, we had for several years, two, three, uh, a group of women in for STEM, 20 highly accomplished Garden City women who had medical degrees, engineering degrees, finance degrees, none of them had that. We now know that our neighbor, Shamanad, of which I'm an alum, has a fabulous STEM center. What do you tell your daughter when she can't have access to that? We hope to address that at some time, even if it takes a visit to Albany and home rule but we cannot leave our women out of this process. K through 12 can revitalize Garden City with science enrichment programs. Question in the back. Hi, um, I'm Jim Hostelitis. I've been here um, 40 years or so. Uh, I have two questions.
questions for you. What percentage of this conceptual development replicates, duplicates, replaces existing space or function? Um, because a lot of this stuff exists somewhere. Uh, you've got a theater here. Uh, you're building a theater there. So are we just simply creating moving stuff to this, to that space? Great question. And then ha having to wonder about this? Yeah. No, that's a wonderful question. It is. It's an, it's an excellent question. Uh, just to give you an idea, if we were to move the curtains here, you'd see there's a stage. And right now they're working on a play. This is not available for any sort of theatrical performance for a good two or three months because they have a play coming. And the students here are working on a play here. So we're not meaning to replace this theater, but to add another one. As far as the recreation center, we are moving what they have here, but they're struggling with all the different functions, the popularity of the system. I've been told that people go, and a lot of people, when they have a new program, have to be rejected because there's not enough space in Blue Hall to accommodate an extra class. So, so, so back to your question. When any of the groups came through, remember what we did was historically say, what have the residents asked us? And that took months of looking over 30 years of documents. If you'd like to see them, we will. So these were resident requests. Then when we had the listening tour every Tuesday night over the summer, we would quiz them. Can't we do that somewhere else? I cannot tell you how many people think they can use the senior center. We, as a committee, could not get space in the senior center on a consistent basis, so we had to go to the historical center. The demand for space is real, and unless our residents are not telling us the truth, many of them have to go out of town for dance, for theater, for other kinds of events, sporting events, and have said, we're spending a couple hundred dollars a year traveling to Syosset or Freeport or other places. So we take them at their word. Could there be duplication here? Of course. Would we squeeze that out during the value engineering and do what is affordable? Yes, we would. But you can only build what is going to be used, and we intend to make sure that this is a building used by those four constituents, seniors, athletes, rec, and performing arts, multiple times a week. And we think it will be used significantly. So we hope. Uh, my uh, second question is on the uh, specifically with the theater. Um, unless you're planning on bringing Broadway here or some version of Broadway or off Broadway, who's going to be doing that? Because I mean, I, I look at the high school and they have what two? They put on two shows a year, I think. Good question. Good question. But the answer will be in your preface. Yes, we would be bringing Broadway here. So, we would be having all Broadway shows here, concerts here, and use that as a potential revenue source for the facility. So this, this isn't purely a community function, this is partly a commercial activity. We have to be, we have to be prepared to find ways to support the process. I wouldn't call it commercial, I would call it Community enrichment, if you would like to see Phantom here rather than Manhattan, why not? And so this is for people who have a different, and don't forget, there are a number of people in this village who have significant Broadway aspirations, and we do have a number of people who could put up a community theater. Do not forget all the different musical groups that have been here over the years. This becomes a magnet for them. And if you don't like that, we could turn it into the Kelly basketball courts. No, I, I just, uh, I, my concern would be uh, utilization, because everybody, every interest gets space. And if you can build something that people are going to use 10% of the time, that's a very expensive use of... Uh, that's no no question. Activity. And that would be part of the value engineering and discussion we would have. And look forward to having with all of you, you have my phone number, Will and Brian are available. This is only the first step of hearing. We have two other town halls. One we will discuss facadism, where we've been working for many months on. 
any other demolition which we've been working on since the very first. You may be more attuned to one of those options, but this is what the village and residents have told us in the last many months, and a record of what they've told us over 30 years. If this is not acceptable to the community, so be it. But it has to be affordable, and it has to be used, and that will be a focus as well. So, excellent question. Uh, last question, and this may sound uh, uh, odd. You used the term affordable. Uh, what does that mean? I think it depends on the person, right? And some people may say zero. You may be one of those people because you see places where it could be and it's all duplicative. There are others who say, I've got to spend $300 to go to Rockville Center to put a party there. And I've got children who want to do that. You'll notice, as I said, that none of those people are here. There are parents who have to drive to Syosset for athletic events or other places for dance, ballet, and musical events. You may not be in that group who is carpooling to these events. They tell us that they have a need for that. Now, how much is that need? Is it a dollar? Is it a thousand dollars? That's a process that we will begin estimating and going through as to what's affordable. But I can tell you this. When we come time to discuss the financial and cost implications, we have to be able to describe what the value of this investment is. This is not an expense. This is an investment. And what the return on that investment would be, particularly in terms of home values. If it does not give you a return, it's probably not worth the investment. So we will be talking to that, and we'll be talking about operating and maintenance issues as well. Three good questions. Thank you. I look forward to uh, further information. Thank and you. I look forward to your further questions. Thank you, gentlemen. It, it, this has been a wonderful presentation and, and very eye-opening. Um, the one question I have is sort of rips off the affordability issue. Um, from what Brian said, the construction of the building, it would require a medieval siege to take it down. Um, and, and so the, the sense I'm getting is perhaps the costs of uh, demolition, um, facadism, which I assume is sort of taking out the interior of the building and keeping the, the nice pretty outside, um, or this kind of uh, reutilization may not be all that different. Um, but the one thing, and this may not be uh, within your committee's remit, um, but will we have uh, an opportunity to know what the operational costs Absolutely. are going to be? Has to be. Going through. Has to be. Absolutely. Great question. So let me just be sure we're clear. This committee takes the commitment from the mayor and the board of trustees seriously, which is to be a source of information so residents make an informed judgment. For those of us who have been here, we did not get to make an informed judgment about St. Mary's. We did not get to make an informed judgment about the Garden City High School uh, Hotel. We did not make an informed judgment about the Garden City Library. Many of these things, including the down zoning and the central property area where you could build homes on their side lots, we're not part of a public discussion. And each of those, we would argue, has taken value from every pocket of every resident in this village, except the people who then sold those lots, sold their homes, and moved to the North Shore. The purpose of this committee is to make sure every resident's voice is heard with a full evaluation of the three reigning concepts of affordable, uh, adaptive reuse, facadism, and demolition, and present that to you so you can make an informed judgment and speak to your trustees. Obviously, the next step at some time is going to be cost estimation, and I know the trustees are working hard at that. We are working hard to make sure the trustees know that we are open and available to answer any of their questions, talk about the historic research, talk about the 
listening tour, and outreach that we will have over the next many weeks. As to O&M, I can tell you the Finance Committee, led by Ryan Mulroney, has been looking at O&M for different kinds of buildings quite similar to this. And so they'll be prepared on O&M. Of course, you won't know the O&M until you know the use. And if we go to facade and what a new building will be, that's certainly what a different O&M. And how much of this building and this wonderful plan will be used or not used will determine O&M. But again, all of that has to be part of a sense of affordability, which we're working on. Thank you for the question. No question? Right here, Bill. Bill, behind you. Behind you. No, behind right, you. one right there. Uh, I just want to go, if you could clarify something for me. You said that the seniors were not interested in a new uh, senior center, that we were happy with what we had. We heard from a number of seniors over the summer. And when we had in our initial plans, not the adaptive reuse, not the historical plans of, uh, that we presented in June, but over the summer we started to talk to groups of seniors as to what a senior center would look like there. Particularly, we said, since we knew the demographic of senior widows was growing. And we were told, hey, we're investing in the senior center. We have new HVAC and other things going on there. No need for a senior center at St. Paul's. We took the name off. There will be rooms and space and other things available for any age, preschool through 80. So the fact that we don't name something a senior center because people feel that that's redundant, that's a choice. But we're open to other discussions, and if there are enough seniors who said we want a denominated senior center there, if that's the voice of the residents, we'll put it back in. I don't know who you asked, because most of the people that I know, and I am a senior, we're not happy at all with the senior center. First of all, it's falling apart. The floor's coming up, being held together with masking tape. The hours end at 4 o'clock. Uh, Let me tell you this, from the point of view of this committee, the seniors are at the front of the line. And if you feel that way, and I fully understand, I fully understand your point, I fully understand your point, then you should be talking to your trustees and let them know, as you are letting us know now, that seniors, particularly senior women, have a different point of view than the point of view we've been hearing. Men also. Okay, happy. Well, listen, we changed it once, we can change it back. Happy to make that change. Yeah, I want to emphasize we classes and everything else there. Who's going to subsidize uh, the salaries and everything for, for all these people that are going to be employed at this new uh, area? When, when we get to the owner, we will address that. But that's a legitimate question, and I believe we have legitimate answers for that. I just want to add on the senior center, I really want to assure you we did a complete layout that was presented prior to this presentation. It occupied one half of the one floor. It had card room, a uh, game room, it had uh, choir rooms, a library, multi-purpose rooms. You know, we did the research, we had it in there, and the seniors that saw it voiced against it. I'm not saying they're right, I'm not saying they're wrong, I'm just saying this was a response to that. We could certainly put it right back. The only thing I would recommend for seniors, just like for children, it should be on the ground floor for ease of evacuation and emergencies. Aside from that, it's up to you. Yes, in the back. Hi, um, I'm one of the younger, um, not that young, but one of the younger members in the audience. And I think um, one of the things that I'm waiting for is just a plan. It's really nice to be asking everyone for input. But I know speaking from my you know, generation, we're kind of instinct. We want to know what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. And then you're going to get people to come to meetings. Then you're going to get people to show up. And I think that's really the, you know, we can sit here and talk all day long about what we want. The gentleman from St. Paul's speaking, you know, he has nostalgia. I have nostalgia. I remember Martin City. But I think the problem is people don't have any patience and they don't have a lot of time, especially the younger parents. 
scientific community, and they just want to say, hi, I'm Mr. McDonough. I want to say, I want to have turf field, I want to have X, Y, Z. This is what we're going to do. Brian Lowry is going to come out, and he's going to give us a financial plan. That's all we need. December 10th, and this is going to be it. And I think that's when you're going to start getting a lot more people to show up and be interested. I think this is really nice, but I think it's not going to get to the answer that everyone wants, which is what's going to actually be in place. So I know that that's probably not what we want here, but I think that's just what I keep hearing from people. So we're, we're welcoming any kind of comment, and we recognize that the age group that you are a representative of is under enormous time pressures. And one of the things we have suggested is maybe we should be looking at a village-wide survey, which might be an easier way for them to have their voice heard. Uh, there is a website, we'll be looking at all of that, but part of what we do is when, in, over the next few weeks, there are smaller groups, affinity groups, the Men's Association, the Chamber of Commerce, other groups, we're happy to go there. If you have friends and neighbors, we're happy to go see them. Whatever it takes to get their voices heard, we will make happen. So if that means that the survey, we'll present that to the board, and if they want to fund it, that would be great. But your opinion is, I think, one of the most important, because you'll be the ones who will be here for the longest period of time. And if we don't accommodate your wishes, then we've missed a big chance. And we're not going to miss that chance. Sorry. Yeah, you, Todd. Thank you. Trustee, so I be brief. I will be brief. Uh, I, I, be brief. My, my point is we should not be divisive about seniors. It's not one group of seniors against another group of seniors. The people that have expressed that desire to you that they are happy there, first of all, the building is there, it's fairly new, it should be fixed. And they have their happy parking spaces, and that's fine. Now, if there are other uses that appeal to seniors, but that, are, that are warranted for seniors, that are not in that building, there's nothing wrong with putting space in the St. Paul's building for those other uses. So I would like to see a united approach, not a divisive approach, all right? I don't think we were divisive, Tom. I think what we I said was, I don't think I'm we were divisive. Sorry, sorry, you had your say. We were not divisive. I would suggest, Tom, that you and the ladies over there get together. What we said was, just so you're, just so you're clear, Tom, stop, stop, stop. You've had your moment. You've had your moment. People know you're here. Now let's get the answer. The moment is, Tom, we don't make that choice. We reflected what people said. This is a new choice. We are going to listen to her, and if you would like to get together with her and come as a United Group, love to hear it. But we're not going to make that decision, and it doesn't go and have that conversation. We'd love to hear that. And even if there is a senior center by name over there, we will accommodate whatever those demands are. Frank, I'm just going to chime in on something that this woman said, which is very important. I want everybody not to miss. One of the things about St. Paul, St. doing this at St. Paul's, is the synergy between all the groups. And you made a very good point, man. You said the senior center is hardly ever open when you want to use it. By putting several groups into the into St. Paul's, we can leverage more open hours because there's more things going on, and you would not be shut out. So, though some seniors say, hey, I like what I have at the senior center, your points are very valid from my perspective. Look, like I said, I came here in 02, I put a, a daughter through the high school, I put my son, he's in ninth grade playing JV football and learning at this fine school. You know, I can't tell you the thousands of dollars that I've spent to go out of Garden City to get things. There was a man at the EPOE meeting that said, six days a week, for ballet, I went to Syosset, okay? Now, we've employed, we didn't bring it up before, but we've brought in experts. We have an expert from the dance and performing arts perspective who looked at the theater and said, my God, the amount of money that that theater could bring in. She said there were groups always looking to get a theater. You could get 10,000 a weekend. She wasn't afraid to throw these numbers out. The synergy by putting everything in one building. And here's another thing. People laugh. They say, you know, I've kind of coined term. We already have a building. It's there. 
Now let's put the ideas to use, because I'm not the criticality. I'll point out, and I, will, and I said, I'm not exactly giving my number out to everybody right now, but if you contact the community to say, St. Paul's, or the Mayor's Committee for St. Paul's, I'll meet with you and I'll speak to you about anything construction related you want to ask. But that's really not the big challenge. The big challenge is coming up with what we're going to do. As the person before said, you'd get a lot more people if you start saying, this is what we're going to do. Well, a survey would have been good. We tried to do one of those. We're going to have to try and do it again. Next question. That's what I was uh, getting at, is uh, I, I don't see a very large turnout tonight. And I know I was here for every other meeting, but a lot of people just can't you know, have that time. Um, and I would love, because I see how much progress has been made since the last meeting and the time before. So I think you guys are, are I mean, going very, very quickly. Um, and for the amount of time now that you've been allotted, I mean, you've only started and been given the time to to work on this for a very short period of time. It hasn't been 30 years that this, this took. Um, but I know that the input over the 30 years has existed. Um, I just was wondering if there was a better way or, or a way to just get the word out more. Um, I've kind of I've sent an email. I, I'm willing to you know, pr you know put a table at the library and just speak to people and let people know if they're going in and out of the library, you know, what the upcoming meetings are going to be. Um, and I was just hoping that to, to you know, contribute um, and also find other ways to be able to get the word out. So uh, but nothing helps more than direct conversations like this. So we are available. You have our phone number. We are scheduling affinity group meetings as well as the three more town halls. October 26 on facadism, November 2 on demo. The individuals who are proponents of that have been invited and they can speak to that then we will present our uh, research, and then they can critique our research. Uh, and so this is something they have been aware of since January on demo, and facadism for some time. Now, in terms of other ways to communicate, we're open to any suggestions you have, but for the next several weeks, we are, any night, any time, speaking to any group, the three remaining town halls. Our goal is to begin a summary report towards Thanksgiving, no later than uh, Christmas, that we would provide to the Board of Trustees. We are available to the Board of Trustees in open session, private session, executive session, anything that they would like. We hope that they will move forward on the cost estimation, because that way we can then have real numbers to discuss. But once we get that cost estimation, uh, Ryan Maroney tells me we'll be in pretty quick order be able to talk about what the O&M would be and what the capital uh, finance plan would be. And he's been working on that for some time, so I know there is something there. Okay. Bruce Torino is now going to sum up. Thank you all for coming. Please remember, October 26th, November 2, and any affinity or special group meeting that you would like, we're open to your suggestions. Bruce. Ladies and gentlemen, this was a spectacular presentation. And I have been involved, this is actually my second tour of duty as trustee, between 1997 and 2001. I was involved and saw all the different iterations of how developers wanted to develop this. None of them were good. This has gotten, has gotten us as far as possible in a short period of time than any of us have seen in a long period of time. Most importantly, this is a community resident driven process. It will be you in the future that will decide what option and how St. Paul's is developed, whether it's going to be adaptive use, whether it's going to be facadism, or if it's in fact going to be destroyed and turn into dirt. It's your option, your vote. It is absolutely imperative that each one of you reach out to your neighbor, have a discussion, go to the website, look at the plans, and make a determination as to what you want to do. Um, 
as the fire commissioner, when I was looking at the plans, I said, guys, what about OEM, the Office of Emergency Management? Because I remember during one of the storms where all of the electrical trucks from Quebec were lined up by the bagel place and really had no place to go. We should have something like that. Now, both my sons were involved in what I would refer to as orphan sports. They were both fencers in the high school. There was really no place for it. My younger son, who graduated from Indiana University with a degree in music, in fact in voice, when he saw the plan for the theater, said, theater is not where you put on a performance. Theater is where you practice your performances. So whether you think that it's not going to be underused, that's not really accurate. So it's important that all of the considerations are appreciated. It's the Board of Trustees that you have to communicate to, make your will known, make your information on what you want to have to the committee, utilize them, use, the, use them as a resource, suggest, and just the most important consideration is, if not here, where? Where would all these activities go if not here? If you have a good idea or any idea, it's absolutely imperative that you bring forth your ideas on what should happen and how it should happen. Thank you. I greatly appreciate all of you coming here. Make sure that your neighbors are aware of the future meetings. Um, we went to an EPOA meeting. We went to a CPOA meeting. And as uh, Frank mentioned, anytime, anywhere, anyone who wants to learn about what is the potential for St. Paul's, advise the committee and they'll be there. Thank you very much. Have an excellent evening.